closed captioning of this program is made possible by the Fireman's Fund Foundation. Governor Jerry Brown makes his case for in a special election in the State of the State Address. When the elected officials find themselves bogged down by deep differences which divide them, the only way forward is to go back to the people and seek their guidance. It's time for a legislative check-in with the people of California. Police Chief Anthony Batts announces that he will stay in Oakland. The Presidio earns praise for progress in its development, but also criticism over its high-cost housing while facing disruption from Doyle Drive construction. And, and travel writer Jeff Greenwald takes us on a journey of strange travel suggestions in his one-man show, coming up next. Good evening, I'm Belva Davis, and welcome to This Week in Northern California. Joining me tonight on our news panel are Jim Carlton, reporter with The Wall Street Journal, Amy Allison, publisher of OaklandScene.com, and Carla Marinucci, political reporter with the San Francisco Chronicle. Carla, Governor Jerry Brown called for a special election on June 6th to try to solve the state's budget problems. What has been the reaction from both political parties and the public? Well, you know, the reaction this week, Belva, has been interesting because this is a drama like California has never seen. We saw him this week. We were there in the chamber. 14-minute speech. This is his eighth state of the state address. And you could see this one was different from any other one we've seen. This is a governor who is an experienced politician who knows this stuff inside and out, who knows these people in the chamber and knows these issues. And that is where the drama is. He's making the case, as you heard in that clip, that it's time for the people of California to weigh in. And he's got the Republicans on the other side who are saying, oh, no, we've got, we've got issues with this, too. Of course, what's being proposed is tax extensions. And California, as we know, $25 billion budget crunch, budget deficit. He's saying this is the only way that this is, uh, there, and there are so many moving parts in this, but the Republicans are saying, look, the people have already weighed in. They've already said they don't want taxes. In 2009, they said no, of course. Both sides in this one are in a, are sort of hamstrung. Jerry Brown, in his election campaign, re-election campaign, said he would not raise taxes unless the voters approved them. So he needs this special election. The Republicans, on the other hand, um, many of them have signed no tax pledges. They, they think that even if this goes on the ballot, that will violate that pledge. But of course, this is the party, even as they say that the voters have weighed in, it was the party that right after Gray Davis was elected, they turned around and wanted a recall. So both sides have some issues How here. How does voting correlate with their no tax pledge? The uh, public didn't make that pledge. The, no, the public did not make the pledge, but the all but two Republican legislators in Sacramento have signed uh, a no tax pledge by a very powerful conservative group, Grover Norquist group out of Washington called Americans for Tax Reform. This is a very big deal to conservatives and to Republicans. And Mr. Norquist, who is very influential among Republicans, has said that any Republican legislator who supports even putting this before the voters is going to be violating that pledge. So right now, Republicans are casting about what else can they do. We heard some talk this week that they're going to suggest that the voters get a ballot that has tax cuts as well as tax extensions. But the fact is, Jerry Brown is saying, look, as he did this week, uh, if you guys have any ideas, you better come into my office and give them to me because I'm not hearing them. And that is the drama that's going on up there. And it's not just the Republicans that he's going to have to win, uh, what, four or five uh, over to his side in order to put that on the ballot. But right. it's Democrats themselves. And he's, in a way, turning back on his own base and saying, hey, I know you're not going to like it, uh, you know, like it or, or, or lump it. we got to deal with the tax. That's right. Exactly. Problems. We're talking about issues that are close to Democrats' hearts, many of them, when you're talking about cutting 
home health care, social services. Uh, Brown is saying he's holding the line on education, K through 12. That's very important to a lot of the Democrats. But, I mean, you're right. When he's talking about redevelopment agencies and doing away with 400 of them, boy, some of the, a lot of these Democratic mayors, including in Oakland, uh, San Francisco, are trooping up to his office and saying, uh, wait a minute, no, you don't. And you have a lot of unknowns here. Uh, look, uh, there are many Democrats up there who Brown has got to win over as well. And I'll take as an example Leland Yee, who's already basically running for mayor of San Francisco. He didn't vote for the budget last time around because looking ahead at what might be uh, in his political future, uh, this, is the, this is the case. A lot of legislators up there are wondering about how redistricting is going to change their, uh, their future, uh, how the top two primary will change their future. So once again, California's budget in the, it is, in the, <laughs> is in the flux here. We, we're the, not exactly sure where it's going to go. Are the Republicans even relevant anymore? I mean, they lost every statewide race in California in the last time around, and the registration numbers just keep going down. It's only 31 percent, I think, of Californians are, Demo are Republican now. 44 percent of Democrats. I mean, you know, re Republicans, right? Uh, the, the party is very, very challenged, but are Republicans relevant? Absolutely. And this is one of the reasons why, right after that State of the State address. Uh, Governor Brown and his wife Ann Gust yeah, went yeah. to a Republican party up there in, San Fr in uh, Sacramento and and talked to the legislators. Okay, wh how fast does this have to happen for it even to be relevant? Well, we're talking about a matter of weeks. If you're, they're talking about trying to get something on the ballot by June and passing a budget by July 1st. We should define what these extensions are. What, yeah, what, the, what the is tax it going extensions. Mean? Yes. Uh, we're talking about uh, vehicle uh, uh, license fee. We're talking about personal income tax and sales tax among the five years yeah. of tax extensions. And Brown is saying, look, if we get these, uh, we, we need to do make this kind of critical uh, move to put California on the right track. So going into the future, the budget will not no longer be smoke and mirrors. Uh, a lot of Republicans are, I think, listening to what he has to say, and he is making a lot of, uh, to get to your question, he's making a lot of uh, outreach to them, going, bringing them in, talking to them, much more than Arnold Schwarzenegger even did. And it's, in fact, it's said that he knows many of them more than Arnold did, who need, he needed a name tags to know the okay. Republicans. D Jerry Brown doesn't. Finally, how quickly do you think that uh, the, the Democrats will come forth and, and yeah, support a lot of, There were a lot said this week when uh, John Perez, the speaker, was seemed to be less than uh, enthusiastic about this or effusive. The fact is he needs the Democrats to. The more Democrats that he loses, the more Republicans he's going to need. So four or five Republicans are important, but the Democrats have to stay on board too. Well, I mean, the most important story over in your town has been the future of the police chief. Uh, that was settled today when Finally. he made a decision. Yeah. So why do you think he decided to stay, and what were his options? Well, uh, no one knew this, but uh, back in October at the height of the election for mayor, he applied for a job down in San Jose. He found out he didn't get the job last week, uh, but he was still going to make a decision uh, whether or not to stay uh, as leader of the force. Now, we have to remember, eight months ago, he was the most popular uh, leader in the city of Oakland. He was responsive to the community. He was attending community meetings. He uh, established a, a public information office that uh, let people know what was happening. But when the city council voted to lay off 70 officers, it was like he became a different kind of leader. And he started saying, hmm... I think uh, in, in, in his public statements, uh, w when those officers were laid off, he said, you know what, we're not going to start responding to particular calls, which is really unprecedented for uh, a city uh, leader in uh, public safety to say, we're just not going to do something. So he started uh, this huge power play with the city council, the then mayor. And I don't think he was sure, based on the candidates who were running for mayor at that time, whether he was going to be a fit or whether the city was committed to reinstating those officers. Now, uh, uh, Mayor uh, Kwan uh, last week uh, put forward a plan to rehire 10. But the, the fact of the matter is, and I was just talking to one of the city council members uh, this morning, uh, we're losing three to four officers per month based on attrition. They're moving to other departments or they're retiring other things. So the city has to be committed to re reinstating those officers. I think there was enough of a conversation there for uh, the police chief to give it one more go. And that's why I think he, he ended up 
saying, yeah, I'm going to stay. Amy, what about you know, budget issues? We're talking about that. I, I know that uh, a lot of people think uh, Jean Kwan has her heart in the right place, but uh, then the budget, there's another issue. She she did tell the council this week that the uh, staffing, baseline staffing is going to be at 666, which we can require another $5 million. Even the city uh, administrator and the council people said, wait a minute, we didn't know anything about the, this. Where is this money going to come the, from? The city of Oakland is facing a huge deficit, and to her credit, uh, the mayor is not going to kick the can down the road. Unlike her two predecessors, including Jerry Brown, she's going to present a budget like a strong mayor and allow the city council uh, to uh, debate its merits and to do what they need to do in terms of shaping it. That hadn't been in, in place in years past. So she's crafting a plan and she's pulled in the budget director into her office. So she's taking responsibility for a strategy to be able to rehire officers. How many of them get rehired? Where does the, funding Where's come the money coming yeah. from? And we have the specter of redevelopment money uh, that now Jerry Brown, who enjoyed redevelopment money and, and developed parts of Uptown and other places in Oakland, now says, hey, you know what? We need that as part of our state budget. And by the way, we're going to push local services down to the county and even the city level. All of that is a big question mark whether that's going to, you know, whether there's going to be enough money to really support public safety and those officers. I think there's broad agreement that those officers should be reinstated because when those officers were laid off, and this is part of what yeah, Chief no, Bat's cr criticism, community policing, that is police that are walking the beats and available to work with neighborhood groups instead of just responding to, you know, 5150 kind of thing, um, that effectively into that program and I th and he's he's really committed to that and I think uh, if the city and the mayor figures out how to fund that he's yeah, going to have to answer a lot of unanswered questions question, right, now. right now. Yeah, what do you think his future plans will be long term and will he get the leeway he wants from the mayor and from the council? Do you think he can now at this point? That's the big question. We're going to see a new budget um, in early March. That's the time frame. And then the city council will be able to figure out um, in terms of public safety how much how many dollars are available. He's probably, uh, and we've heard that he's been in, in conversations with Mayor Kwan about what that could look like. But here's one thing that we know that he needs, we, he needs to start looking at the growth of the department because we've had attrition from officers and there's no, there hasn't been a, uh, a training uh, for two years and there, there isn't a plan. And I think he wants a plan to put another crop of, of recruits in, in through the training. So I know that's one thing uh, that, that it's cost $2 million. He wants to see that happen for the future of the department. So when, it, one time was in Oakland, the number was 800 officers. Was that at the beginning of the Dellums administration? Well, that, 837 that, was that, the yeah. that was right. We're and down, uh, we're down to remember uh, we had that, yeah. we had that crop of uh, graduates and all this fanfare. And now uh, the city facing this budget crisis, you know, and the city council, and I, and I can't talk about public safety without mentioning that the city council and the mayor's office uh, were in fights with the police officers union. They have a very unusual uh, pension plan where the city pays 100% of their pension. They were trying to get the, the union to renegotiate that so that they say, look, we can't afford it anymore. The union in essence, through the younger officers under the bus and said, okay, go lay off our younger right. folks. And this is exactly the kind of discussion that I think you're going to see around the state on these issues of pensions. And right. No all, of it, all of it comes together, and usually it's under a title called budget. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Well, now, what is going on with the Presidio? This is a crown jewel of the Bay Area, and now all of a sudden it's... Uh, it's hit some sort of a wall in terms of its funding capabilities to yeah. keep it going? Belva, in 1996, Congress turned the Presidio over to the Presidio Trust, and they were charged with um, you know, making it financially self-sufficient by 2013, in the next two years. And to do that, they had to overhaul the military housing. There was 1,100 units of housing that officers and uh, whatnot lived in, and also rent out commercial space. Uh, they got L George Lucas, uh, you know, that was a, that was a big pull. Um, <clears throat> but really where they're getting most of their money really is from rents. And they decided to charge market rate for most of the housing out there. Uh, that's been controversial uh, to some of the uh, uh, advocates for affordable housing in San Francisco. Because some of these uh, uh, facilities go for anywhere from $2,000 for a two bedroom apartment at Baker Beach to $20,000 for an eight bedroom mansion, which overlooks the Golden Gate Bridge mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, downtown San Francisco. and. You know, uh, some of the uh, streets, uh, you know, for a three bedroom, you, it's $4,000, um, you know, up to, you know, 9000 I'll say that the people out there seem to love it. Uh, I interviewed a number of people out there. 
<clears throat> I interviewed one gentleman who's in a $6,500 a month um, four bedroom home. He says, I'm living in a, th this will be a $3.5 million home, but I don't have to spend a million dollars up front to buy it. Um, you know, I have real estate elsewhere. San Francisco is too expensive to buy in. And so this is a good deal. Plus, if he needs a plumber, he, he gets three the next day. The, the, presid the Presidio really takes care of their tenants. Um, you know, How nice for him. <laughs> very, very, very nice for him. Um, but, I mean, the bottom line, though, is that uh, that has succeeded, and now they're almost self-sufficient. Um, they On an operating basis, they already are. And so, you know, um, they, they, they're, they're happy. Jim, what, about the commercial, was, yeah, what about the commercial side of this? Because that's where the potential protests are. That's where, you know, what, what are the prospects here? There's a lot of controversy about who should be able to go in there. Mm -hmm. what, how does it look? Well, that's uh, been a battle, really, from the get-go. And uh, there was a big fight. Uh, you know, the Gap founder, Donald Fisher, they wanted to put his art collection into a museum uh, in the Presidio. That got shut down because they thought that would be too gaudy and, and too commercial. Uh, now there's a fight over a uh, 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 like a 14 building hotel which would be on the main post parade grounds. And that's the most historic part of the Presidio. This goes back to the 1700s. Um, there's been military uh, formations out there. And so, I mean, it's still up in the air. Uh, that hasn't, uh, that's gone a little slower than the residential side. They need more money, uh, uh, roughly $500 million to complete that kind of renovation. The residential, uh, they spent over $100 million. There's another building out there, the Presidio Landmark, which um, uh, for city development uh, completely overhauled is a former hospital. Uh, they need to lease that. They're, they're in the process of le leasing that. Right now, if those are part, high, uh, you know, uh, high end apartments, and those aren't leasing quite as quickly uh, as yeah. the other housing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, and I would ask you about affordable housing because if it was the city of San Francisco that was, you know, the, the agreement is 20% of the housing become affordable, that's certainly not the case out in the Presidio. It's federally owned uh, land that's being developed. Is this becoming a haven for the rich, the rich kind of a little mini Manhattan in the middle of the bay? Uh, Amy, that, that actually is a criticism in some quarters. Um, you know, the Presidio will say they, they can cite studies that show they're actually on par with the city of San Francisco when you include everything. And uh, there's, uh, you know, over 1,100, uh, you know, 1,100 units, but 400 of that, there's uh, apartments at Baker Beach, which are $2,000. Uh, 18% of the housing is for affordable uh, uh, families, affordable income. And, uh, but the, you have to live on the, and you have to work on the base to get that. Do they have vacancies? I mean, do, are they having problems running this? Has the recession hit there? No, surprisingly, I was surprised to see the vacancy rate is like five. I mean, it's the occupancy rate is ninety-five percent. <coughs> believe it or not, I mean, it's yeah. really, really high. And and again, I mean, one of the streets they uh, called uh, I think it's Leggett. They j they jokingly call it Mayberry. You go down, it's brick facade homes. Uh, there's tricycles out in front. All these young families, and it looks like right out of Mayberry, yeah, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I know, I know, we've seen politicians. Yeah, you know, we were at a boxer event. Uh, they all troop down there and, and do the. Here's where jobs are happening because uh, they receive stimulus funds and so forth with the Doyle Drive. Uh, have there been a lot of jobs created? I mean, what 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 is the scene? Out there? I think yeah. I mean, definitely. I mean, you know, you got the uh, you know the, the 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 huge win out there was the you know the Letterman the, the Letterman complex, George Lucas. There's a lot of jobs right. out there, and then the Walt Disney Museum. So I mean, they they are making money out there. Yeah. So overall, it's a rosy picture but they have to do something about right, the, right. the low income it, yeah. housing. Well, my thanks to all of you for joining you. us here tonight. <laughs> Thank you. based writer Jeff Greenwald makes a living visiting other countries. KQED's Dave Iverson spoke with Jeff about his experiences. Jeff Greenwald, you've made your living through your love of travel, including various travel writings, your books, Shopping for Buddhas and Size of the World. And now you've turned that love into a one person show called Strange Travel Suggestions. How did that come about that you would transform writing into performance? Well, it came about uh, about six or seven years ago. The Marsh Theater in San Francisco was putting on a series of travel monologues, and they asked if I'd like to come out in between the acts to read for my books. And I thought about it and I said, you know, actually, no. I would love to come onto the stage, but I'd like to do something that's more theatrical. And so the director, Stephanie Wiseman, said, well, 
you can do that if you can think of something. So I spent a few weeks thinking about it, sat down with some friends and artists and other writers, and came up with this, this idea of telling travel stories based on the spin of a giant wheel. Well, that's, let's begin with that then, because you invite people up on stage and they, and they spin a wheel, much like the Wheel of Fortune. What's mm -hmm. the point of that? What's the idea behind that concept? It's very much the Wheel of Fortune. It's the, uh, the sense of how destiny impacts our travels. And the, uh, you know, the, the sort of the title for the show is Strange Travel Suggestions, which is taken from a wonderful line from Kurt Vonnegut's book, Cat, Cat's Cradle where he says peculiar travel suggestions are dancing lessons from God. Mm -hmm. So there's this element of serendipity, of sort of kismet in, in, in our best travels. And I sort of wanted to, you know, use the wheel to, to make yeah. that happen. Oh, and where it done. stops is where you go in the show. And those stopping points are things like the kindness of strangers or what else? What are some of the other points at which the wheel might stop? It can stop at the fool. It can stop at a place called the map is not the territory, um, theater of the absurd, the ugly American, meals of misfortune. There's 30 stops altogether. And this was one of the big questions at the beginning. Are we going to make each of the stops on the wheel a specific story or a specific place? And what I decided to do was make each one kind of a theme. Hmm. So for each place the wheel stops, there's, there's three or four stories. Well, let's see an example of one of these stories. This is the point where the wheel stops where the example we're going to be is? It's a, it's a stop called in a dry, dry place. In a dry, dry place. So this is a story you're in, in um, Nepal and you're riding on elephants. It's beautiful blue sky sort of day. And then you enter into this sort of darker part of the jungle. Right. Um, and then let's, let's pick up the story from there. We came into this sort of dark part of the jungle, and suddenly it, it, began, it began raining. And this seemed completely strange. And I turned to Diane, who is a naturalist, and I said, I didn't know the jungle you know, had such strange microclimates in it. I mean, it was sunny back there. It's raining here. And then we just sort of look at ourselves and, and look at our, our clothes, and we see that the rain is actually bright, kind of almost fluorescent yellow. It's a fluorescent yellow rain, and, and Jitu, who's, who's sitting in the front of the howdah, looks back and goes, like, uh, monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, the jungle is full of monkeys who have all come together over the, over the trail for their daily entertainment of peeing on the tourists. <laughs> An excerpt from Jeff Greenwald shows strange travel suggestions. Strange, I guess, would be the underline there. But part of the point is to be available for surprise, right? Even mm -hmm. a surprise you might not necessarily put in your itinerary. That's right. And uh, I think those of us who've, who've traveled, I think everybody who's watching the show has probably done some traveling, probably realizes that it's those moments where we're kind of steered off our, our normal itinerary, where we wander away from the route that we had planned and you know, take up a strange suggestion. Either we've met somebody, or you know, we see a, a, a little alleyway, or, or the sign of an intriguing cafe. And it turns out that that's really where we're meant to be. That there's a lesson in that place that turns out to be the, the point of our whole journey sometimes. And is that what you want to encourage within your show? This kind of availability to be ready f to be to be random and to become what you say is the difference between being a traveler and a tourist. Yeah, that's really an interesting question because I think these days, you know, it, it seems to me that people used to travel in a sense to, to see new cultures and to really experience other places, almost for a sense of remoteness from their normal lives. These days, people travel, they want to be connected. They want to stay connected through their computers and their networks to everything that's familiar. I just want to remind people of what an expansive experience travel can be and how it can really introduce you to things that are that are quite far into your normal experience and off your grid. You also show during the show um, the tarot card of the fool. Mm. And you like the metaphor of the fool, that we should be ready to be fools when mm. we travel because why? To, that, that, that we're ready to sort of step off the edge, that we're ready to take the proverbial leap of faith? That's exactly it. The, the, the fool, which is the central it's card of the tarot deck, is, is sort card. of this, this blithe it? youth who the steps fool, into the world and, uh, and begins the journey know, through life as a leap of faith. And all great journeys, I believe, all of our greatest travels are really, they're not a planned itinerary as much as a leap of faith into the world to see what awaits us and in encounters and places we might find. 
And Lass, how do you continue to engage the audience? Because travel stories, after all, when some people hear, oh, I'm going to go hear someone's travel stories, they go, ooh, <laughs> where's the exit? I mean, how do, you, how do you make that something that engages people and, and promotes the idea of being a traveler and not a tourist? Well, I think that, uh, first of all, having people come up and spin the wheel is really wonderful, and they're always rewarded with uh, some chocolate or a yo-yo, so that, <laughs> that, that gets them interested. Um, also, I just think that the nature of the stories, people can really identify. Often they're about my doing something foolish and being redeemed at the end of the story. And, and people can really put themselves in my position. And one of the fears I think a lot of people, maybe a lot of Americans in particular, have about travel is that they'll, they'll somehow be appear foolish or be disliked. And I think it shows that even from the most, like, you know, dicey situation, you can find redemption and a great life lesson also. To be ready to be a fool, be ready to be redeemed, be ready for strange travel suggestions. Jeff Greenwald, thanks very much. Thank you. And Strange Travel Suggestions continues at the Marsh Berkeley from February 10th through the 26th. And that's all for tonight. Visit kqed.org slash thisweek to catch up on complete episodes and segments, subscribe to our newsletter and our podcast, and share your thoughts about the program. I'm Belva Davis. Good night. Major funding for arts programming on This Week in Northern California is provided by Diane B. Wilsey. Additional funding provided by the George Frederick Jewett Foundation, Helen Sarah Steyer, and Fred Levin and Nancy Livingston of the Shenson Fund.